Good afternoon. Welcome into the Tuesday, December 22nd edition of Market Talk. I'm your host, Jesse Allen. Great to have you here with us. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Hard to believe we're just a few days away from Christmas coming up on Friday. But uh, happy you're here to join us. we got a lot to talk about today. MarketTalkAg.com. That's our home on the web. MarketTalkAg.com. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. It's all at MarketTalkAg. And many of our great radio affiliates nationwide, including KGNC in Amarillo, Texas, KGLO in Mason City, Iowa, uh, KGLR in Redwood Fall, Minnesota, and so many more. You can find us via all radio products as well. A lot to talk about today. Let's bring in our guest, Jim McCormick with agmarket.net. Jim, good to see you and uh, Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to you, Jesse, and thank you for having me on. Appreciate you joining me, Jim. And man, oh man, we got a lot to talk about since the uh, last time you and I talked in this market. <laughs> man, oh man, uh, we've been on a ride, especially soybeans. Uh, yesterday was a great day. And even today, a late push in this market uh, closed us a little bit higher. I mean, Wow, it's, I'm starting to feel like uh, you know, there's a lot of volatility in this market. It's almost becoming like a day trader's market in a way, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's been a while since a grain market you could day trade and make 10, 20 cents out of it. We're really kind of getting there. And I think the exciting thing, or maybe a little bit nerve wracking for some people, is I think this volatility is here to stay. I expect that volatility to increase as we go into 2021 because the fact of the matter is with the U.S. carry out where it is, Every bushel loss in South America really gets exasperated price-wise. So uh, volatility, I think, is here to stay, which is kind of exciting, especially yeah. for the day traders out there. Definitely. Well, and you mentioned you now every loss in South America. And we, I know we got strikes going on down in Argentina and weather issues and everything else there. And, and a lot to talk about that's affecting our markets. And I, I want to ask you a question. I, I, I heard you on another program yesterday, I believe, talking about short-dated options and I want to start there because I think our listeners might be interested to know a little bit more about short dated options, especially with this market, with the amount of volatility that is there. Can you maybe just talk okay. about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. The options are traditionally a lot. Any producer who traded traditional option, like let's just call it like a March option. You buy on the right to own March futures, like a March $14 bean strike would give you the right to own March corn, March beans at $14. That option expires in February. Now, if you went out and bought a November option, a new crop hedge type of situation, mm -hmm. same strike is going to cost you a lot more because it's all time. Well, the CME group, CBOT, came out with these what they call short dated options, serial options in essence, which allows you to buy a shorter time frame. Right now, a March option you buy for 14, a $14 call will expire in February. Well, if you want to just play this big January report coming on up here, which is going to be a big one, it's a quarterly grain stocks production revisions in South America, production re revisions for the U.S. You can buy what's called a February serial option, which gives you the right to own March futures. But instead of expiring in February, like the March option does, this one expires in January. So that's one way to play it. That's the serial option. The other one is a short dated option is based on the new crop price. So well, let's say you want to go in there, Jesse, and you want to protect new crop beans for this report. Okay. Well, an at the money November bean put is going to cost you 70, 80 cents because you're buying the right to sell November beans through the all the way through the end of October. But you're like, I don't want to worry about through the October. I just want to worry about this January report. Well, you can buy what's a, a short dated February short dated option for the new crop strike, which means you're buying the right to sell November bean futures. But that option expires at the end of February. So you're not buying a whole lot of time value. So the option is quite a bit cheaper. So it allows you to play these reports for new crop hedges and maybe not spend quite as much because the fact is with the volatility we're seeing, the cost of options are getting very, very expensive. Yeah, and uh, we were talking about that a little bit before we jumped on air, just the, the cost. Uh, it's getting so expensive, especially it's soybeans. And would you say short-dated options, do you think that's a good idea for some producers who are trying to – I mean, let's be honest, Jim. There's a lot of producers who sold beans already, so it's getting tougher and tougher to pry beans away from these producers because there's not as much out there. I mean, you know, looking at the soybean arena right now, looking at the future side – would you say short dated options are, are maybe a better thought or does it just all come back to what works for your operation? Well, I think it depends on what works for your operation. The reality is the options are not going to make you as much money as a straight out futures position, you know, but they're also going to mitigate the risk. I mean, you talk about the volatility. I mean, 
you know, Sunday night, the market opens at new highs for the move, I believe. You know, by Monday morning, we've crashed down and you're thinking, uh-oh, this thing may be in for, you know, and everyone who bought Friday is all depressed. And then by the end of the day, we're higher. Well, you know, if you're getting to the point and say, look, I just want to take some of this risk off the table, you can you can get rid of that, sell the cash market, and use these short dated options. Well, it allows you to get into the market with not quite the expense of a longer dated option. Because a lot of people only want, you know, the, the movement we're seeing right now, Jesse, you don't need to buy six months worth of time to trade the market. Heck, 30 days is making a big move. And right now, between now and the January report, you can see a whole lot of volatility. The weather, you mentioned it, South America, Argentina is dry. The forecasters I'm hearing are saying a week, 10 days of hot, dry weather. When I mean hot, I'm talking 90 to 100 plus degree temps. Now we come out of the holidays. There's a little bit of rain in the forecast in the long range maps. But we come out of the holiday, Christmas, this Christmas Eve holiday, Sunday night, Monday, and they've taken that rain out of the forecast. This market may explode higher. So you say, I'm going to sell some of the cash beans by these cheaper short dated options or zero options that just get me long for the next 30 days. I don't risk as much because on the other hand, we will come out of the holiday weekend and they put rain in the forecast. You could see kind of a correction. So yeah. it allows you to play the market, maybe kind of mitigate some of the exposure. So if you kind of got a little bit of risk aversion, consider the options. Well, I love how you set that up and I, and I appreciate the, some of the insights into that. And, you know, looking at soybeans, I mean, the other thing too, obviously watching that carry out, a lot of people thinking it's going to be closer to hundred million than 200 million, you know, moving into that January report. And, you know, looking at crush rates, still good. I mean, th this January report, right, we're setting up for, I think, a lot of fireworks one way or the other. Oh, I 100% agree with you. The only question I have, I think they got to go to 100 million. Yeah. The crush we just had here, in the last crush number in November was, what, the third best crush ever? I mean, so we are crushing beans. Now you got a problem in South America. There's 100 ships waiting to load in Argentina right now, loading out corn, meal, wheat and soy oil. If they keep this strike going and that crop gets smaller in South America, it's going to drive more meal and oil demand in the United States. So that's kind of going to cause the government to raise the crush. So that'll drop your carry out maybe from 170 down to 150. Now you got the exports, Jesse. We've exported 90% of what the government projects we're going to sell. Normally we've sold about 65% for this time of year. So the odds are they're going to have to raise that export number. If they raise that export number, 50 million, and now your carry out's down to a incredibly bullish 100 million. Mm -hmm. So the real question is how quick will they admit it? And why do I say that? Think about what they did to the Chinese. The Chinese bought, they've been saying that China bought 7 million metric tons of corn. They stuck with that number, even though we sold them 10, they stuck with the seven for a couple months before yeah. finally raising the number. I do think they're gonna raise that number in January. Will they cut it down to 100 million in January? Maybe not, but I do think you're gonna get a friendly number. And if you wanna to apply to play that report with a little less cost, those short dated cereal options are one way to look at it. Jim, uh, let's move over to corn. You kind of mentioned that there a little bit. I think that's a good spot to switch gears. And uh, we set a new contract high today at the close, 443 and a half. Um, you know, I know there's more corn sitting out there in the countryside and bins right now. A lot of producers, you know, watching this corn market trickle higher off the uh, soybean momentum. What are your thoughts with this corn market and what you're seeing out there right now, especially with another strong close today? Well, right now, I think you got to be, I'm a little bit, the only thing I'm a little bit leery about the corn market near term is the ethanol crush number. Now, I think the government's pretty accurate on the number, but with the pandemic raging, people not driving as much, I think that's something we need to be cautious about. But the fact is the export demand for corn is still running way ahead of pace, just like the beans. I don't believe the Chinese are done buying. We haven't seen the big flash sales, but they are been consistently buying. So I think that's going to drop that corn carry out probably closer to one five. That gets you a stock use at 10%. So I think that argues the corn market's going to go higher. The other thing we got to talk about, Jesse, is new crop. Um, the fact of the matter is you plant 90 million acres of corn, 90 million acres of beans, and you have trend yields, you're not going to add a whole lot to the ending stocks due to the strong demand we're seeing. So I think for the first time in a long time, we're going to have a real uh, acreage battle. So if beans really make a push higher, the corn's got to go higher just to kind of stay competitive on the acreage argument. So uh, I think there's some definitely bullish themes ahead of us going into 2021. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, and I think that uh, you mentioned that acreage battle. That's going to be so key. I think the January report and the acreage battle, and the sooner we get that info you know, set from that January report and really see what we've ended up with, that's going to help us make those decisions for spring planting and that acreage. And I, I definitely think that's so key. I think uh, 
those are probably the two biggest headlines outside of weather troubles in South America that we really need to watch the next couple of months. Well, that's it. And it's going to be an emotional because let's face it, it's dry across the Midwest. So it's one of those years we may start off really, really dry, kind of like we did in 2011. And then we'll see what happens if the rain comes. I mean, we will get some acres back. The prevent plant numbers have been kind of historically high the last couple of years due to the wet springs. Maybe this year we are going to get some of those acres back. But the fact of the matter is with the world stock so tight of food, there will be a battle all the way across as the producers try to decide what they're going to plant. We are hearing a lot of corn on corn and hydrus being sprayed even today, being the fact it's so mild in the Midwest. But then you go out to Iowa where they had all that down corn due to that derecho. There's a lot of pressure on what those guys are going to do because there's so much corn on the ground. A lot of argument there is they're going to have to go to beans just to kind of to kind of get back into that rotation and kill off that volunteer corn. So uh, the acreage battle is going to be exciting, which I think is good for the producers. That's going to give the market reasons to rally. And it's going to be a great opportunity for producers to uh, lock in some phenomenal profits, not just for the 2021 year, Jesse. Let's, you know, I'm going to encourage producers to keep an eye on 2021, 22, 23. You know, we get a big enough bull market. You could set your farm operations up for multiple years, potentially. Yeah, a lot of potential out there, a lot of volatility, but that's uh, what makes it even more important to kind of keep tabs on everything and work with folks like you at agmarket.net to make some strategies and make sure you stick to that strategy let's uh let's talk wheat producers uh, here real quick jim wheat uh, another decent day there especially on that uh, on the chicago contracts on the soft red side um i know wheat you know we had a dollar correction a little bit but we kind of just shook that off today what are you seeing in the wheat market right now i think the wheat market's going to rally I I would limit to 25 to 50 cents would be my guess. I think the wheat will be the laggard right now. A big chunk of the mid, you know, big chunk of the wheat market right now is now going to dormancy. Uh, the Russian wheat crops kind of struggled into dormancy. Our crop obviously is dealing with a lot of drought in the Southwest, but it's hard to get too excited until we get into the springtime. But it, you know, we stay dry in the springtime. Russia is already talking about an export tax and they limit exports. That will keep a bid in the market. But the wheat right now, I believe, is going to be more of a follower. It'll be, follow, you know, corn and beans will lead us up, but the wheat will follow a little bit. Yeah, and I think it'll be interesting to see as well with corn, beans, and wheat here as we head to a uh, shortened week this week and next week. We'll see where we wrap up the week on Thursday uh, with our trade, and we got, you know, another day and a half to go basically. So we'll see what we end up with, Jim. Well, that's it. We uh, Just for the producers, we do close at noon on Thursday. We're off. Thursday night, Friday, open back up Sunday. That's where the volatility of the Sunday night market can come in and play in those short data to serial options. And then we do it again the week after. We do trade a full day, the last trading day of the year, but we'll be off for New Year's Eve, closed on Friday, and then do it again Monday. So we're setting ourselves up two volatile weeks, especially with kind of weather watching the South American weather. Yeah, a lot of volatility for sure. Let's move over to livestock quick, Jim, and just touch on that real quick. Uh, I know not a lot of activity in feedlot country today, but um, you know, the cattle side, we were lower on on fats and feeders today. Both complexes down fairly moderately, um, but that box beef number you know, still remained uh, fairly strong. We were up again today. Uh, what are you seeing in this cattle market right now? Anything to get excited about or anything to get nervous about? Right now, I think in general, we're in a sideways market in the cattle market. I, I don't, I think we're going to struggle to rally due to the near term pandemic, you know, shutting down cities and just the time of year. We're just not going to see that holiday demand that you traditionally would see, uh, people not having parties and all that. But on the other hand, Jesse, I don't see the cattle beef market falling out of bed. There's a lot of optimism. People are starting to get. These shots, we've talked to several people who are involved in the healthcare industry that I've talked to have already had their shots, no adverse effects. They're happy to get it. And I think as we go into the spring, second quarter, third, fourth quarter, especially, the demand I think is really gonna be robust. We've been locked up as a country, as a world. I think you'll see a huge exile of people wanting to go out to eat, spend money, go on vacation. So I think that'll also keep the market supported, especially in the, in the deferred contracts. Sure. On the hog side of the equation, uh, kind of a ho-hum day there today. We were a little bit mixed, pretty flat and quiet there. I know we're really watching uh, China and, you know, if they're you know, they're ramping up their production again, we're, we're watching that. That cutout value was down today after being, you know, up a lot yesterday. I know we just got a lot of hogs out there, though, uh, Jim. What are your thoughts on this hog market right now? 
Well, right now we got the hog and pig report coming out. I think the flash line we'll see is we see a little more. I think they're looking average guess like a 1% contraction of the hog herd. That's mm-hmm. kind of what we need to see. Uh, the China's a little bit of concern to me right now because China's definitely ramping up their production dramatically uh, from the swine flu. And that's going to hurt a little bit of our demand. But I think overall, just like the beef market, as this economy starts to spend money, I think you're going to see the hog market find support as well. Just simply the contraction of the hog herd, contraction of the beef herd, counteracted with the expanded consumer spending money. You got this new stimulus, you know, Family Four is going to get an additional, what, $2,400 here in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully that'll keep the beef market or the protein market combined a little bit supported. Yeah, I know. Kind of the same story we've been talking about for quite a few weeks with cattle and hogs and just the same factors with COVID and everything else. We'll have to watch and see how that all plays into this market. Jim, any other final thoughts uh, you have for us today? The only thing I can say is I uh, wish everybody out there a safe and Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. If you get any questions, give the Ag Market team a call. Um, but in general, my best advice for people is put your wish orders out there. I mean, you see the volatility that like Jesse pointed out is going to get probably ramp up and it's going to give you some opportunities. You know, give that elevator a wish order to sell corn if you like. If you want to get a re-ownership, you know, put those orders in. You may not think you're going to get filled, but right now volatility is the world word and uh, try to take advantage of it. Definitely. If folks want to reach out to you and the team at agmarket.net, I know they can go to the website, obviously, or what's that phone number to call? It's 844-424-6758 and they can reach any of the Ag Market team members. That's awesome. And that's the best way to do it. Jim McCormick with agmarket.net. Appreciate the time as always. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me on. Thank you, Jesse. Jim McCormick with agmarket.net, our guest today here on Market Talk. Find us online, markettalkag.com. This has been the Tuesday, December 22nd edition of Market Talk. I'm your host, Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.